You might be able to tell I've got a little bit of a theme going on this week. Um, we re Originally, I named this session Composers in the Neighborhood um, when I thought that this course would only reach Saskatoon. Um, but happily, it has gone further beyond that. So um, now I'm just officially dubbing it Canada Week. So welcome. Hello. Welcome to Musical Herstory. I am Kendra Harder. And yes, in class today, we will be talking about Canadian composers. Et maintenant, en français. Bonjour tout le monde, bienvenue au Musical Herstory. Je m'appelle Kendra Harder. En classe aujourd'hui, nous parlons au sujet des compositrices canadiennes. And now to make this even more Canadian, I am going to apologize for my atrocious French. <laughs> so yeah, an apology is very Canadian. Um, and I will not be doing the whole class in English and French because I'm not very good at French. Anyway, welcome. Um, so helping us today on the tech side of things is Matthew Praxis. Everyone say thank you to Matthew. And also a huge thank you to Mark Turner and Eric Peckow and the Saskatoon Symphony Orchestra for hosting this class. So we are we apologizing. <laughs> we are live streaming from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and we acknowledge that we are on Treaty Six territory, the traditional territory of the Cree peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We pay our respect to the Cree and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. So Canadian musicians, um, what's really exciting about our musical landscape here in Canada is we have this hugely diverse population, which means we have this hugely diverse mu uh, music and arts that comes out of here. You know, we have our indigenous communities and then for like the last couple centuries, we've had immigrants coming to Canada from Europe and all over the world. Um, and still to this day, we, we still have new Canadians coming in. Um, so yeah, we have this amazingly beautiful tapestry of different cultures and heritages. And yeah, that is one of the most exciting things about uh, the Canadian art scene. And so the two people that we're talking about today, Alexina Louis and Chris Dirksen, are both trained in the Western classical idiom, but they combine their own heritage into their music, which gives them this incredibly unique and um, yeah, just wonderful sound. So first up, we are talking about Alexina Louis. Um, she is one of the most established Canadian composers. Like when you think of those big careers, like of Kaya, Beethoven, all of them, like this is Alexina. Like she is a huge name in Canadian music. So it's just, I had to, I had to talk about Alexina. Um, her works have been performed by almost every orchestra in Canada. She has a very strong relationship with the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, Montreal Symphony Orchestra, and the National Arts Centre in Ottawa. She's been played by orchestras in San Francisco, Indianapolis, um, and she's also had a piece played up in space. In 1992, the astronaut Steve McLean took her piece, Starfield Night, up into the sky. Ah, so cool. Um, her pieces have been performed and broadcast internationally, and she has this incredibly large eclectic um, body of work. It's all still very Alexina, but because she's been commissioned by so many different um, ensembles, uh, she's worked in so many different genres with ballet, made for TV opera, which is an incredibly unique thing. I don't think we have anything else like that. Like I. I think the only ones we have are the stuff that is with Alexina and Dan Redekin. Like those are the only made for TV operas I know of. Um, yeah, so it's, it's pretty exciting. So Alexina was born in Vancouver, that's British Columbia, in 1949. Um, I read this really great story about, um, so in Chinatown in Vancouver, every year they do a Chinese New Year's parade. And one year when she was, a ch I think she was a child, um, Alexina followed one of the dragon puppets, you know, past all the shops as it was going by. And she had a microphone and a tape recorder and she was following it and recording the loud drum rolls and the clanging of the cymbals that accompanied this dragon puppet as it went down the streets. And her father thought she was a little bit off her rocker, um, but Alexina was certain she would use this dance someday. So she kept that music and uh, she was right. She did use it one day. So she studied at uh, the University of British Columbia and she got her Bachelor of Arts there. 
And then in the 1970s, she went to California and she spent about a decade there. Um, and that's where she studied her master's in composition at the University of California at San Diego. And there she studied with uh, composer Pauline Oliveros. And so uh, while she was there, she became a member of one of uh, Oliveros's women's ensemble, which is where she worked and developed this event called Sonic Meditations. And one of the pieces that Alexina brought to the group uh, became an integral part of these events. Um, but after graduating from her master's program, Alexina stopped writing for a while. Uh, she just didn't feel like she had anything to say yet. She really wanted to just kind of assimilate all of this knowledge that she got in her education. Um, you know, and at the time she was kind of feeling more like a student studying composing, studying composition as opposed to being a composer. Um, so then during her years off, she began studying her Chinese musical heritage and she was also researching um, Asian literature and philosophy. And this sort of sparked this idea in her mind to fuse the two things together. Um, so the first piece she tried, um, she really wanted it to be meaningful. She didn't want it to be superficial, but the first piece was, it was kind of, you know, obvious, but she knew she was onto something. So she kept working at it. Um, and it took many years and many pieces, but eventually um, she figured out how to make it a part of her voice. And so when she finally learned how to express herself, that's when she started to feel like being a composer. So after her time in California, she moved to Toronto, where her unique compositional style was recognized by the Toronto music scene, uh, resulting in commissions from the city's preeminent performers and ensembles. Um, she also uh, soon followed suit was the national and international broadcasters. Um, and she was quickly setting herself up as one of the leading composers in Canada. Um, so a little bit kind of about her music, musical style or process, I suppose, is um, when she was studying with Eliveros, um, her teacher made her account for every single note that she wrote. Like if you're putting it on the page, you better have a reason as for why you're putting that note right there on the page. And so it gave her this huge attention to detail. Um, and then when she like works with different musicians and different ensembles, um, she writes her pieces to tailor to those ensembles. She gets to know their music, their work, their repertoire, their playing style, and she uses that to help inform how she writes the composition. Um, she also, with all these different instruments that she encounters, um, she tries really hard to understand all the different little possibilities. She talks with her performance, asks them to produce certain effects, um, and she'll even try the instruments herself and just kind of fine tune the special effects in her rehearsals. Um, she also has a large collection of uh, Chinese instruments and some of them like she uses in her own pieces, um, like actually like her specific instrument. Um, there's a story of, oh, I think it was like 10 years ago, um, a French ensemble, like France French, not Canadian French. Um, they, they had commissioned a piece from her and she wasn't able to go to the premiere, but she heard the recording back later. Um, and this, I don't remember what instrument it was, but it didn't. She didn't quite like whatever they had done. And so when they came over to Canada to perform it, she brought her instrument and she had them play on that. So she got the sound that she wanted. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's this, it's this attention to detail and her, her blend of the East and the West that makes her music so richly rewarding. Um, and then revealing a great depth with each exposure. Like every time I listen to her music, you just notice little other things and it's, oh, it's good. It's very good. So before we get listening to music, I'm just going to give a little uh, disclaimer, I guess. Um, I wasn't able to find the piece I really wanted to share of Alexina's on YouTube. So I have found it on both uh, Naxos, which lots of people have access to through their public libraries or their university libraries, but also the Canadian Music Centre website, CMC, um, which is where I'm going to play the piece from today. Um, so I was ahead of the game and because I figured people would need to find a recording themselves of this, um, I put a little how to on how to access the CMC recording. Um, I'll get Matt to put a link in the description of the video. Um, but for some reason, the link doesn't go straight to the actual piece. It goes to like the catalog page. So I just, I put that in there for those of you who aren't tech savvy. 
Anyway, um, but then if you aren't able to access Naxos or CMC, because I'm actually not sure if regionally outside of Canada, the streaming can be accessed. I hope so. I, I don't actually know, though, um, being from inside Canada. Um, but I've put in another piece of hers, um, which is the Omanya Mysterium in, in memoriam of Glenn Gould, um, which is kind of one of her really huge pieces. Um, she wrote it in response to the untimely death of Canadian icon Glenn Gould. Um, he was an amazing pianist. He did lots to champion the words, works of Bach. He has, I might be wrong, but I think he's recorded like a good huge chunk of the repertoire. I almost said all, but I was like, that's not right. Cause there's a lot. Anyway, but that's Glenn Gould. So in the YouTube playlist, um, that piece is under the title Academy Chamber Orchestra Performs Alexina Louis. Um, so that's where you can listen to it. It's a beautiful piece. Um, and you can t completely feel these different stages of grief when you're listening to it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great piece of music. But the piece that I really wanted to talk about was Music for Heaven and Earth. This was written in 1990. It was commissioned by the Toronto Symphony Orchestra for a tour of the East Pacific Rim. And this included cities like Australia, Singapore, Taiwan, and Japan. Um, so like, that's pretty cool. Like, when's the last time you heard of an orchestra doing a tour? Like, that's pretty awesome. I'm sure it's happened more, but anyway, back on track. Um, so this, and then this um, tour was also supported by the Canadian Broadcasting Company, so CBC and the Ontario Arts Ca Council. So um, thank you CBC and Ontario Arts Council for supporting that tour. And um, please continue to do such great um, supporting of the arts today. So with this piece, because it was going to have such a global impact, um, Alexina really wanted to think more universally. Um, it wasn't just going to be played in Canada for Canadians. She wanted it to yeah, have this universality to it. Um, so the inspiration, there's, there's a few things to it, but one of the big ones is this coffee table book called The Home Planet, which was edited by Kevin Kelly. And it's of photos taken of Earth from outer space by satellites on a NASA mission. Um, and this is particularly true of movements three and four. Um, so like her sort of total arc of the piece, it's where you begin on earth and then, you know, her as a woman on earth and then kind of going up into the stars and uh, looking up there and just seeing this celebration of, of the oneness of, pardon me, of heaven and earth. Um, yeah, and so she uses lots of different uh, Asian instruments in it, it's a really neat piece. Um, so in the score, there's a call for Chinese opera gongs, which are bender gongs, uh, hand cymbals, Japanese temple bowls, a water phone, lion's roar, kabuki blocks, there's two water gongs and an elephant bell. Um, and so these like bender pitch uh, percussion instruments, what happens is when you strike them, um, the, the pitch alters, it bends up or down about like a whole tone or maybe even a little bit more. Um, so for example, like with the water gong, um, so it's a gong, like a tubular bell that you strike um, and then you immerse into water or you um, strike it in the water and immerse it out. So then if you immerse it into the water, uh, the pitch lowers, so creating a Doppler effect, or if you lift it out, the, the pitch raises. Uh, so it's really, it's really cool. I um, mean, she also emulates some of these bending percussion instruments in her woodwinds and her strings with glissandi and whatnot. It's so cool. Oh yeah, okay, and this is really freaking cool. Um, I read this in a paper that somebody wrote about the influences in, in Alexina's music. And so the subtlety of inflection is just as important in music as it is in language with the Chinese music. I thought that was so cool because it's, it is, it's very tonal, the, the language, you know, like you, where you pronounce the vowels and the words, you know, it, it, it means something. And so then that the, the music kind of emulates the language I thought was so cool. Oh, yeah, I am excited about this piece. Can you tell? Um, so I'm going to read you first the titles of the movements. Um, I'm just going to show you a little bit of, of two of them. Um, but so the first movement is called Procession of Celestial Deities. Second movement is Thunder Dragon. Third movement is Void. Fourth movement is Earthrise. 
okay and i'm just gonna get a little anne of green gables on you but like that title is so romantical like just love it and then the fifth movement is called river of stars which is the chinese way of describing the milky way ah my mind is just going on fire with imagery um so i'm going to show you guys a little bit from the void and from Earthrise. So in the void, she really wanted, to, she was inspired by astronaut Charles Duke's description of this total blackness. It's quite neat. Like she creates almost this like airy sound as if you're up there. Cause it's like, it's almost like there's nothing there but then you have these low rumblings in the contrabassoon and it's just wah. Um, and then the next bit I'm going to then skip ahead to is in Earthrise. And just like the way she's got everything sort of shimmering. Um, oh, the inspiration. Sorry, and this was inspired. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. This was inspired by an, an astronaut who was looking at Earth from the surface of the moon. So it's this idea of like, you know, how we have the sunrise, but then they have the Earth rise. And so it's like this beautiful, like blue ornament in this very black sky. And so, um, yeah, we kind of still have that very spacious, um, space <laughs> that, that Alex Zina's created. But then she has this gorgeous oboe melody um, that she uses. She says she wanted to write what was her most sort of, I wanna say like a love for the earth. And so like just that most um, romantical of sounds that she could at the time with this, with this melody and it is gorgeous. So without further ado, let us now get to the recording. Okay. Internet. Okay, so this is void. before I get us like into this and then just never stop, I'm now gonna move up to the bit of earth rise. I think go here that I wanna start.
I could just stay there for hours. Like seriously, it feels like, yeah, it feels like you're there. So I'm sure none of you are surprised to hear that Alexina Louis has many awards in her back pocket. She has received the Office of the Order of Canada. She has multiple Juno awards. She's won the Jules Leger Prize for chamber music. Um, in 1990, 92, and 93, she won the SOCAN Award for Most Performed Canadian Composer. Um, and it, this is pretty exciting. In 2019, so last year, uh, she won the Molson Prize in the Arts. And this is the first time that this has been awarded to a female composer. Now, this isn't necessarily completely sexist. Um, that you know that hasn't happened till now because it's it, the prize encompasses all of the arts. So other um, Canadian notables that have got this award before are um, authors Alice Munro and Margaret Atwood. Um, so yeah, but we're still very excited that Alexina got the award because she deserves it so much. Um, she has been commissioned by the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, Montreal Symphony Orchestra, the Griffin Trio, uh, violinist James Ennis. Um, yeah, and she is fantabulous. Please do yourself a favorite and uh, listen to some of her music. And if you go to her website, she's got a few uh, clips there as well that you can listen to. So I'm actually, I've moved a little bit faster through Alexina than I'd like to. But that's because the next person that we're going to talk to you about is the person I am the most excited to talk about. Um, when Mark first approached me about this class, the first name that came into my head was Chris. We're talking Chris. We're talking Chris Dirksen. I am so excited. Um, so the first time I ever heard her music. Um, so I was this is when I was working at the library. I used to work there. Um, and I was, I was shelf reading the collection, which means I'm making sure everything is in order. And the CD caught my eye called Orchestral Pow Wow. And first I was like, <gasps> appropriation. And then I was like, oh no, Dewey Decimal, we're good. We're in the, we're in the indigenous, indigenous music, we're good. And so then I was like, well, this just sounds interesting. So I pick it up and I turn it around and it says Cree Mennonite cellist. And I was like, done, borrowing it, so excited. So then I took it home. And oh my word, it was just such exciting and beautiful music. It's just like very grounded and true and oh, it is so good. So we are going to talk orchestral powwow, but we're gonna get there. Um, I'm very excited. Um, so, so Chris's music is really um, unique because she braids all these different little things into into her music about who she is. Like when she was growing up, she would have like, she did of course listen to some classical, but she also listened to like Offspring, Nirvana, The Beatles, Salt and Peppa. Um, she has all these different little uh, things that come together to make her sound her own. Um, and it's very exciting. So who is Chris Dirksen? So she is a Cree Mennonite two-spirit cellist. Um, and for those who don't know, two spirit is the indigenous way, um, way of talking about being queer. So I hope you all know now. All right. So, oh, and in one, in one interview, she called herself a Cree Mennonite, which just made me laugh. I love it. So Chris comes from a long line of chief, chiefs from North Tall Cree Reserve on her father's side and a line of strong Mennonite homesteaders on her mother's side. She grew up in Edmonton, Alberta, and she was raised by her single mother. So her mom, raising her on her home, didn't have a lot of money, but that didn't stop anything. Uh, so go Chris's mother. Thank you for being an amazing woman. Uh, so she started, so Chris started taking piano at five years old, and this is a great story. Um, well, okay, the great story comes after I tell you this. I got to have a little interview with Chris on Saturday. So exciting. Um, so she told me this little story. So uh, when she was about seven years old, her piano teacher came to her mom and was like, you know, I'm not sure that piano is for Chris. She's not very good. And her mom was like, well, what are you talking about? She plays music all the time. And so she decided to sit in on the lesson. And so Chris gets to the piano, music's in front of her. And yeah, she, she didn't know it. She had to sight read it. She, she had no idea what she was doing because she wasn't, you know, practicing it. And her mom was like, well, then what are you playing at home all the time? 
And Chris said, well, my stuff. She was writing her own music. <laughs> So um, Chris got into playing cello, though, um, through what's called the Edmonton Public String Program. Um, and this is a super affordable program. Uh, it's $300 for the year for lessons for the instrument and the opportunity to play in a string orchestra. Um, so this gave her the privilege to, to learn how to play. Um, I believe the program is now called the Music Enrichment Program, which is held through the Edmonton String Players Association. So thank you for keeping this program going because everybody deserves a chance to learn how to play a stringed instrument, not just the people that have the means to do so. So thank you for having that program. Um, so that's where she learned cello. Um, and then she went to the University of Alberta for two years. Um, and then she finished her performance studies at UBC in 2007. Um, that's University of British Columbia, uh, same place as Alexina. Uh, so, but going into university, she knew that she was going there not to be an orchestral player. She had no intentions of being in a, you know, in a symphony and that kind of thing. She went there to learn how to be a better player and performer so that she could perform her own stuff. Um, you know, she, she was saying that she wants to make her music and her cello 2000 and now. She wants to make it accessible to her friends and to her Indigenous community. And so like this is part of what just creates such a unique sound for her because, um, yeah, she has all these different backgrounds and she braids them together. Um, she says it's like being a jeweler. You take all these different gems and stones that you like and then you put it in your own special bracelet that you can create, only you can create because it comes from your own perspective. And like, seriously, her music is so uniquely Chris. Um, it's so good. So one of the big things that she does um, is she plays with effect pedals and loop pedals. Um, so for those who don't know what that is, um, effect pedals is like your guitar effect pedals. Um, in the classical world, we see so many people using effect pedals, saxophone players, string players, Chris Derrickson, um, and then loop pedals, um, what those are is you can record like yourself playing something and then um, it just keeps playing and you can put layers and layers on top so you can almost accompany yourself. So how Chris got into the loop station uh, was when she was in university, she had a roommate who had a loop station. And so then one day she just took to trying it out and it just fit. Um, she loved it. She wrote four songs that day. Um, so yeah, it just, this loop station allowed her to create this sonic world without, um, you know, without needing to hire anybody else because she's a musician, um, especially a university musician. You, you, you don't got a lot of money when you're a, a university musician student. So um, being that she was already gigging um, in university, this allowed her to um, gig without having to hire a band um, or pay or share up a, a fee. So that was pretty awesome. So first, I'm going to show you this great clip of one of her pieces uh, called Winterborn. Here we go. And I'm going to start at the beginning, but then I'm going to just skip ahead because um, this piece, like, it's long, but it really kicks. Oh, yeah, so all of this is done with a cello. Like, she is a one-woman show. Um, and so when you hear something and you're like, hey, that's lower than the cello can go, that's because it's an effect pedal, um, which can bring it down the octave. Ah, so good. I hate stopping good music. <laughs> so good. So. Um, so I, I had to ask her, because um, I see all of that pedal work and it just looks complicated and very, um, well, like something I would totally screw up. Um, I also think of like organists when they're playing organ, like with the pedals and everything, like tons of coordination and practice. And yeah, absolutely. Um, so I asked her if there was ever a time that uh, she missed some of the loops and, and it kind of threw off the whole piece. And she's like, oh yes. So there was a story of when she was in New York at the Association of Performing Arts Professionals um, at a Globe Fest. And this was a huge showcase to, uh, to get. And this was with her trio. Um, so her trio, I'm just gonna touch on that quickly, uh, is the drummer, Jesse Baird, who used to play for Feist, and then the hoop dancer, uh, Nimki Asawamik. Um, and because I couldn't find any um, like full videos of the full trio, I included a video in the playlist of Asawamik's dancing. So it's not with a female composer, but 
it's amazing. Um, so I'll just let you see a little bit of his dance. Um, and so their trio is, it's not like a traditional trio, it's more of this performance art. Okay, so back to New York showcase. Um, and so they're up there, they're playing their gig. And she had this, this song where just like, she was me messing up every one of her loops. Like she was just missing them by about half a beat. And so uh, even though the piece was supposed to be in four, four, uh, it was more like four and three quarters. <laughs> she says, uh, it was like a new wave jazz band, um, but her drummer, Jesse was awesome. He totally followed. Um, they, they didn't get any more gigs while in New York that time, but she did get a sponsorship from Roland. So go Chris. So the day after she graduated from UBC, uh, she was off to play in Spain at the World Music Expo. And that year, she also started a three-year stint of playing with Inuit throat so singer, Tanya Tagak. Please do yourself a favor and, uh, and listen to some music by Tanya. Uh, I've, I've seen her play twice here in Saskatoon with the symphony and oh my word, it's just so, I can't even come up with words for it. It's so good. Uh, and like, seriously like extra fangirling because Chris has met Tanya and worked with Tanya. Um, yeah, and so also when she was uh, touring with, with Tanya, she also was introduced to Canadian icon Buffy St. Marie, um, which is really cool. And, and Chris figured Buffy didn't know who she was, you know. Um, and so then at, at New Year's, she got this message from Buffy saying, I wanted to, you to know that I'm your number one fan. Like, how cool is that? Like, one of your musical heroes sends you that? Like, so cool. So she asked Buffy if she would be willing to mentor her. And Buffy said, yes, a thousand percent. Um, so yeah, they, they spent a while uh, just kind of talking together. Um, Buffy even asked questions about the loop station and they got to sort of play a bit with that. Um, but they mostly talked about um, Buffy's experience in the industry. Um, you know, her experiences of being a woman, her experiences as being an indigenous person and how she had to go through like misog uh, misogynism and uh, racism and how she's, you know, made that path for herself. Um, and she gave, she gave Chris lots of really good teachings. Uh, one Chris shared with me, which I really like, um, it's this idea of how to deal with public, the public's perception of your art. And so Buffy told her that when you're making albums, when you're making um, music, it's like you're growing peaches. Um, some years, everyone is going to want your peaches, but then other years, nobody's going to want them, but that's okay. That just means that there's more peaches left for you. Your art can nourish yourself. I thought that was just brilliant. So now I want to get into talking about orchestral powwow. And um, the best way is just to let Chris do the talking. So there's this great video of her um, talking about orchestral powwow. Here we go. Orchestral powwow is exactly how it sounds. It is contemporary indigenous powwow music with a chamber orchestra ensemble. Being half Cree and a classically trained cellist, it was a way that I could bring both of my roots together and bring my classical traditional roots alongside my indigenous ancestry. Actually what made me start to think really seriously about this project is I sit in on a lot of arts grants and I was reading a lot of grants of orchestras wanting to incorporate indigeneity in some way and often what happens is they, uh, they hire a white composer, usually a white man composer, to compose uh, indigenous-esque kind of pieces. And I feel like we're at a place in time where, you know, not about us without us. We're at a place in time where appropriation, you know, things have been taken over and over and over and over again. And within the, like within our colonial history, that it's time that um, an indigenous person wrote uh, classical music for indigenous uh, artists. We're showcasing the power group in the middle and front and center. So we're showcasing indigenous artists as the front and center and the European classical music are around to support. I wrote this whole thing with the idea of the powwow being in the center and the front and everyone around, all of the players, they have to listen to the powwow beat. They, it's, it's about time that we start listening to the Aboriginal beat first. Um, 
and, and us follow after. So really what I hope people do is listen. So uh, the album Orchestral Pow Wow was actually originally just a concept album. Um, and so she worked with the Tribal Spirit record label, um, which is a contemporary powwow record label. Um, and so she used recordings from there about uh, a couple different powwow groups. And uh, Chris made sure that I knew that powwow is a living art form. It's not just an old timey thing. It is still active. It's still being written today. Um, so what she did was she wanted to write music around the powwow music. She didn't want to try to like stuff it into a box to fit inside of something pre-written. She wanted to honor it and write around it and give it that space. Um, so the album was received really well. And so then it was turned into this live show. Um, so it's a 45 minute show and it features the Chippewa Travelers and they are from all over Northern Ontario. And so Chris never wanted there to be a conductor. Um, she wanted the European classical players to follow the beat of the indigenous drums. And this puts the indigenous artists front and center. And so orchestral powwow has been performed around most of Canada. It's been to Halifax, to Yellowknife, to Vancouver Island. Um, yeah, so it's pretty exciting. So the first um, piece I'm gonna show you is the round dance it starts off very slow and then the drummers come in and it's really powerful so i want to share uh, that part of it with you first um, i've included it in the youtube playlist but i'm actually gonna play from uh, just i my own uh collection here just because it's easier than youtube <laughs> that um, but I also want to show you um, a little bit of another piece from from the um, from the album so when I was listening through um, I noticed that on the piece new women's song and improvisations on sunset which featured the traditional singer Jennifer Kreisberg that there were no drums and so I asked Chris about this um, and so she said with the uh, improvisation 
um, it was just an improvisation with, with Jennifer in the studio. Um, I think it was like 12 to 15 minutes and then she's spliced together the, the, five, minute, um, the five minute piece. Where with New Women's Song, um, she's just like, they don't need it. It doesn't need the drums. Um, you know, her voice is just so powerful and moving on its own. Uh, so I wanna play a little bit of the New Women's Song. <laughs> So um, I hope you noticed in the video with Chris talking about orchestral powwow, the phrase that she used, not about us without us. Um, and a really um, just important thing, important discussions going on um, is this idea of cultural appropriation. And um, me and Chris talked a little bit about it. Um, so she shared this amazing document with me that she has given me permission to share with you all. Um, so where it comes from, is about a year and a half ago, uh, Chris was at the Banff Center for the Arts um, at what was the first classical indigenous gathering. And there was about 10 people there. Um, Chris and Jeremy Dutcher were at the helm. Like she knows all of the coolest people. Okay, anyway. Um, but while they were there, um, they, were they were there to build community and to talk about um, what needs to be done in the arts. And so, yeah, it's about building the community within themselves and then expanding the community and finding ways to move forward and create relationships with institutions that are good and they are healthy because we have a lot of reparations that we need to do here. Um, so I'm now gonna read you this document um, called Musical Sovereignty that they came up there together. So this is from their point of view, not mine. I am a white person. This is their document and we respect their words. So musical sovereignty, sovereignty, maintaining ownership and control of our stories and artistic projects is of vital importance for indigenous creators. The stories we need to tell at this time often significantly vary from the existing canon of indigenous inspired works. Simply, a story is indigenous when it is created by an indigenous artist, regardless of theme or topic. A story is indigenous, whether it comes from ancestral knowledge through to the present day and beyond. We as the indigenous creators are best positioned to tell our stories that discuss hard truths faced by our communities 
while ensuring appropriate steps are taken to provide emotional support and aftercare. We seek an end to those musical works by outsiders that shock audiences and re-traumatize our most painful experiences. To non-Indigenous composers who seek to tell Indigenous-inspired works, be honest with yourself and ask why you feel compelled to tell the story and whether you are the right person to do so. As Indigenous creators, we value our non-Indigenous collaborators and creative partners. We invite partnerships across all levels, librettists, orchestrators, performers, producers, curators, artistic directors, etc., and insist that when telling stories that are specific to Indigenous experiences, that we as Indigenous creators are granted authority and full oversight on how our Indigenous communities are portrayed. Recognize that we as Indigenous creators will be held accountable by our communities in cross-cultural projects and that this represents additional responsibility and emotional labor in our creative work. As Indigenous artists, we hold ourselves accountable to our communities. We seek to represent our peoples truthfully and in our full complexities. We too ask ourselves if we are the right people to tell these stories and recognize that we as Indigenous creators do not always have the positionality to tell every Indigenous story. We seek to hold ourselves to the highest ethical standards of Indigenous community engagement and request that our collaborators in the Canadian music community work to the same level of accountability. Thank you, Chris, for sharing that with us and allowing me to share it with this class. Um, so our conversation went on to include more than just Indigenous people because it's not just them that need more representation, it's the entire BIPOC community. So that's Black, Indigenous, people of color, our minorities. Um, there is definitely a lot more that needs to be done. Um, we're getting more awareness now with, with light of things that are happening with Black, Life, Black, Black Lives Matter and with being home with COVID, um, but this needs to inspire some action. Um, you know, it's good to um, call out classical music. Um, it gets a beautiful time to hire BIPOC composers, conductors, um, and Canada needs to start getting its Canon up to speed of what Canada actually looks like. Like I mentioned at the beginning, beginning of the class, like we are a very diverse country. So our music that's played at our symphonies should reflect that. Um, Chris says that often she hears about orchestras worrying about people not coming to concerts, that they're worried that the symphony is dying, but it's because you're not making it for everyone. Um, you know, saying that patrons only want to hear the masterworks is not putting faith in, in the people in your community. Um, it's also saying that the only part of your community is your patrons and it's not, it's this broad and beautiful community. And so we as people, people and organizations, uh, it's time to start building friendships and relationships with our communities, getting to know them, who's there, what do they wanna see? Um, you know, we need to build bridges, we need to open doors and those doors need to stay open. It can't just be this token gesture of, oh, right now it's really, it's really cool and like in vogue to hire people of color. No, 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 this needs to, this needs to keep happening. That door stays open, it's not just this little, you know, one off that you do know we want to continually have um, proper representation across the arts. And so thank you, Chris, for sharing these thoughts with me so that I can share them with others. And hopefully we will all do better. Um, and we'll start being more inclusive. So on a light -er note, what is happening right now with Chris? She is so busy. Um, she is working on music for an Indigenous Fashion Week. Um, and she's also working on the music for a four part docu series on the history of BC, which is um, unpacking how the province and its laws came to ensure the benefit of the white settlers and detrimented everybody else. Um, but it's, it's cool that she gets to like write this sort of stuff. Um, she's gonna be pretty busy. Um, she needs to get 30 minutes of music to them every two weeks. And like, that is a lot of music in two weeks. Like sometimes it takes me a full week to get like, four measures of good music, especially at the beginning. Um, so yeah, she is insanely busy, um, but so good. Like, I'm so excited to hear that composers are busy right now because um, there are people in the art sector that are um, not so much right now because of, of the global situation. But um, please check out Chris's albums. Um, she's got two with her trio, The Cusp and Collapse. 
Of course, there's also orchestral powwow and she's a part of other tons of collaborative um, albums. So yeah, just give her a search and uh, yeah, check out her music. She's so good. So yes, I went over, don't care. Are there any questions? Ooh, cool. Somebody has a friend who is playing a new commission of Chris's this Saturday. That is so cool. Da, da, da. And if there's no questions, we can totally just listen to more music, which is really awesome. Let's just play a little bit of the Alexina Louis piece that is in the YouTube playlist that we haven't gotten to. Um, so this is a little bit of her um, Omanium Mysterium. And it's for 44 Divisi string. I'll keep my eye on the q and if you have questions, ask. But I'll just put some music on. Once it starts. So somebody here asks, do we know the significance of the standing orchestra, a preference of the orchestra or the composer? I think this might be the orchestra preference, but I actually don't know. I'm very sorry. I will look into that on my phone while this continues to play.
right, I've attempted to find the score on the CMC, but it's not loading. Um, but the person who asked the question Googled the orchestra and it just seems to be something they do. Awesome, thanks, Nelson. All right, so our own Matthew Praxis has texted me a question. What does it say, Matt? How do composers of live music and improvisation deal with notating their music? Are some pieces meant to be put on paper and some not? Oh, thanks, Matt. That's a question and a half. Now, some composers will like put sort of like improvisational guidelines in. Um, oh, I can't remember her name, but she was here in Saskatoon for the Strata Festival a couple years ago. Um, and she sort of gave like parameters of where to improvise in the instrument with like certain types of effects. Um, and that was like notated in there. Um, yeah, I mean, I've got a piece of guitar music that's kind of uh, improvisation nearly E and it's quite, they'll put like different, um, uh, they'll, they'll put in um, like kind of X notations and being like, do this. And this is kind of the idea. And here's sort of a shape. Um, every, every composer is different too. Like, um, like Armory Schaefer will use like graphic notation. Um, yeah. Any other questions about Canadian composers? Cause this is so exciting. How often do you get to talk to a Canadian about Canadian music? Unless you're all, you know, here from Canada. <laughs> oh. What about Anne Southam? I know the name. I know she's also a part of, um, there's this really cool CD series that came out with the CBC. Oh, I wanna say like two decades ago. Um, and uh, she's on that. It's like the Canadian composers collection. Really cool, it's got interviews. And um, like, so there's two discs for each composer. One, one, one disc is uh, interviews and then the other is music. Um, yeah. We go to the Canadian Encyclopedia. <laughs> yeah, so she was born in Winnipeg in 1937. And looks like she died in 2010. She was interested in visual arts but she turned to composing at age 15 after attending a summer music camp at the Banff School, now the Banff Center, which is a great um, place. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know much about, about Anne. All right. Well, thank you everyone for being such attentive listeners and for learning about Alexina and Chris. And uh, so next week is our last week, um, which is pretty crazy. I can't believe that the class is almost over. Um, if you're looking, if you want to know how to access the CMC, I posted a video on um, on my Twitter and my Facebook page. So please uh, follow me. And uh, I try to put little things in conjunction with the class on there. Um, oh, somebody's asking about Emily Doolittle. I like her. Um, I saw she's she is mentioned in the Listening to Ladies podcast. If you guys get around to listening to podcasts, there's a great episode about Emily Doolittle. All right, everyone, you have a great night. Stay warm and uh, yeah, adios. <laughs>